Hello there. Welcome to another podcast from Bible Base Podcasts. With me, Ron Bailey, from BibleBase.com. This is study number three in our Bible Base Advent calendar, where we will be doing a countdown to Christmas and a few days beyond with brief Bible studies, about 15 minutes or so. You ought to be able to find these studies in Bible Base Podcasts at BibleBase.com at Friends of Bible Base on Facebook, as a Bible Base blog post, and especially at newliferadio.co.uk with Mike Coles. So this is number three, scheduled for December the 14th, and I'm beginning with a verse from Genesis chapter 49, where Jacob is making a prophetic pronouncement over his sons. It, it, this is his deathbed scene, and he gathers his sons together for a final admonition, prayer, and blessing. This is Genesis 49 verse 10. Jacob says this, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the obedience of the people be. Time flies, they say, and sometimes it crawls. Time passes unevenly in the Bible narrative. Sometimes a couple of verses will encompass decades, and sometimes a whole chapter will only record the happenings of a single day. Much has happened in the story by the time we get to the end of the first book of Moses, usually known as Genesis. Our last pause in the unfolding story had Abraham and Isaac as its main theme. But by the time we reach today's portion, many years have passed. Abraham and Isaac are long dead, and Isaac's son Jacob is now an old man. Possibly two hundred years or more have passed. Jacob, renamed Israel by God, has gathered his sons together around his deathbed. In this last will and testament, he delivers a remarkable prophetic utterance. First, he disinherits his natural firstborn son, Reuben. Reuben ought to have had the blessing and the double portion of the firstborn. But Jacob gives headship to his fourth son, Judah. And he gives the firstborn's double portion to Joseph. Seven centuries later, the descendants of these two sons will become rival kingdoms. Israel, Joseph's descendants, and Judah. The blessing of Judah illustrates an important biblical truth. Western culture has generally told the story of history in a linear pattern, a straight-line progression of one event followed by another. It gives history a backbone and helps us to keep things in chronological order. But God's perspective is often quite different. This is Second Peter chapter 3. But, beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. This is a profound concept. At one and the same time, God sees events in time-lapse and slow motion. We see side from the inside. God sees time both from the inside and from the outside at the same time. When prophets proclaim the word of God, this feature often leaks through, and events are not necessarily declared in our strict linear order. A promise of a Messiah. Both Jewish and Christian commentators have been united in seeing in this verse the glint of a messianic promise. It leaks through the linear, time-based blessing and rises to a higher level. If we examine the single verse, we see it's expressed in terms of authority and rule. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, 
nor the ruler's staff from between his feet. The scepter is a symbol of authority and rule. It is the ruler's staff. It would be more than 600 years before this prophecy found its fulfillment in the coronation of David, a descendant of Judah. Before the time of the monarchy, there was no scepter in Israel and no hereditary dynasty. The dynasty began with David, and it continued in the nation of Judah for 400 years until it was dissolved by the exile of the nation of Judah into Babylon. 400 years of blessings and disasters, of good and bad descendants of Judah and David, but nevertheless it survived until there was just no way back. In Second Chronicles chapter 36, it says this, God has given a final invitation to the northern kingdom of Israel. And it says, But they mocked the messengers of God, and despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets, until the wrath of Jehovah arose against his people, till there was no remedy, or, as the Hebrew has it, until there was no healing. Until Shiloh comes. And then another 600 years without a descendant Judah, without a son of David upon the throne. But God's will is not to be thwarted by human failure. And our verse continues, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the obedience of the peoples be. The place of Shiloh became the home of the tabernacle during the time of the judges. But that's not what is in mind here. The word Shiloh has been translated as peacemaker. It comes from the same roots as Shalom, peace. And our translators are pretty well unanimous in following the statement with the personal pronoun, him. Shiloh here, then, is not a place nor an event. It is a person. And unto him shall the obedience of the peoples be. What promise is this? A peacemaker to whom the peoples, plural, would be obedient. This is not a narrow promise for the descendants of Jacob, or as we generally call them, the children of Israel. This is a promise that encompasses all peoples. Before the world had been divided into the people and the nations or the Gentiles, we have here a promise that has no such distinction in its view. Just the peoples. Unto him shall the obedience of the peoples be. Joy to the world. The scope of this promise is astounding, but only the peacemaker can accomplish it. The United Nations, for all its good intentions, can never fulfill its hopes. Only Shiloh, the peacemaker, can accomplish this. And he will accomplish it not by crushing one nation under the superior might of another, but as the people submit to the peacemaker. Unto him shall the obedience of the peoples be. Now I am covenant sensitive. I know that the promise of a people who, by instinct and choice, are obedient to God, is something that the old Sinai covenant could never deliver not because God was unable, but because the people were unwilling. And as the epistle to the Hebrews tellingly expresses it, because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. That's Hebrews chapter 8, verse 8. The pronouns are very significant. It does not find fault with it, the covenant, but with them. There was no fault in God, nor in the Sinai covenant. The fault was with the people who were not obedient unto him. Here then we have a subtle promise of the new covenant that is even older than the inception of the old or Sinai covenant. A time is in view when a peacemaker would appear and the people being obedient to him, they would find reconciliation between 
the Sinai covenant people, and the Goyim, the Gentiles. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 15, Paul writes this of Christ's death. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. As an old favorite chorus expresses it, he is our peace who has broken down every wall. Unfinished conversation. I have a little phrase that I sometimes use to illustrate God's faithful pursuit. In common with many preachers, I find that people will share all kinds of things with me. Sometimes there are gaps of years between these conversations. The person seeking help will recommence a conversation that literally paused years ago. The preacher, especially as he gets older, is sometimes hard-pressed to remember the earlier conversations. But I've noticed in God's pursuit of men and women that he frequently returns to a conversation that we thought had ended years ago. He takes up the conversation at the exact point it was paused and sometimes continues as though it were uninterrupted. It is so with the progressive revelation of the Scriptures. A shining revelation seems to lie forgotten for hundreds of years in God's dealings with his people, and then, without warning, appears again. We see life's tapestry from the front only, and the coloured thread sometimes disappears from our view. But God has not broken the thread, and could we see it from his perspective, we would see that he is ever mindful of his promises. Do come and join me again tomorrow. God bless you.